fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and we are at the interview part of the show. Uh, today we are going to be talking America's first female serial killer, and uh, we're with us is the researcher author of the book, uh, Mary Kay McBriar. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about murder and ladies. <laughs> well, this is one of my favorite <laughs> subjects. <laughs> well, they go hand in hand, don't they? <laughs> Sometimes they sure do. Especially when you're talking to Alan. So. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, I'm a character. So listen. Um, uh, what brought you to this topic and writing about it? Like not only being interested, but you've actually researched and written a book about it. Yeah, so the what brought her story to my attention is I heard it on a podcast. And as I was listening to the host explain um, the, the crimes that she had committed, which are atrocious, she is definitely a monster, um, I couldn't help thinking, like, okay, but there there has to be more to the story because it just sounds like she was so likable and precocious, and I know that that doesn't, like, just because you like someone doesn't mean that they're not terrible. They can be totally the worst and nice to you. Um, but I, I just I felt like there was more to the story, and so then I was like, well, I'm going to go see if there's a book written about her because I want to read it. And uh, there there was a book written about her, but it was – very journalistic, very much fact-based, and while I respect that a lot, it was not what I wanted to read. Um, and I think the reason why I didn't want to read that, and this is what actually led me to do in, um, a lot of my own research on the topic, is that I had worked with kids before in a residential emotional um, mental health facility, and they, they had similar beginnings, if that makes sense. Um, I, To my knowledge, none of them became serial killers, uh, but they definitely had the odds stacked against them. And in, in a lot of them, even though they were underage, had uh, criminal records already because, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. So I just feel like uh, that's what drew me to the story initially is thinking there was more to it. And then trying to find more about it and kind of coming up short from what I really wanted. Well, yeah, and if you listen to a podcast, it's, it's never going to be that thorough anyway. Right, right. You only have a little bit of time. So. Well, there's only a week or so to do the their research and then write a script and put it on a show. So, right. you know, that's, a, that's fair enough. But the um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, it's really interesting that um, – this drew you in even more. What 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 is it that you want it to cover more at more intensely? Let's say than um, what you had read about her already. So the book that I found about her is by Harold Schechter, which if y'all have ever watched any true crime historical true crime show, he is the man. Like he yeah, is so. the talking head. He is the best. He is. So cool. I want to be friends with him so bad. Well, I can give you his number. He's oh, my so God. Don't tease me. <laughs> I've, 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 I've known him about 10 years. We've been oh, my gosh. How cool. Well, so you he's... know, then, how amazing he is. He's so thorough. <laughs> yes. He knows so much. But you didn't like his book. So, Harold. No, I did. Talk. I did like his book. It just wasn't <laughs> what I wanted to read. You know, like you find something yeah. and it's like, oh, I know a lot more about the subject now, but I didn't feel like it told the story because that's not really – that's not what he wanted to do. Right, right. Know? Well, no, I've written a lot of books in the same style as Harold, um, where it's, uh, yeah, it's more more factual, more detail, and not a lot of not a depth in the story. 
Well, well, right, and that takes a lot of work as well. I mean, you, you know, like he did oh, yeah. so much of the research for me that I'm so grateful I could just look to his bibliography and find, you know, <laughs> the sources that he used. Um, but yeah, so I, I, when I read that book, though, um, I do remember thinking, like, oh, so this is very thorough, and I still feel like I don't know the story of her. Like, I don't know why. And I know that that is the case much of the time when we hear about true crime, is that we don't get a clear why. But I, I just felt like it should have been given, and this is not just like that book at all, because it, like I said, was amazing. But at the time period, um, she was just kind of written off as like, oh, well, it's because she never got married and had kids. And they even... There's a point where she says that in her confession, which I have, I take issue with that because I just don't trust that she would say that based on all the things that we knew about her life and the way that she approached problems and conversations. It just didn't fit to me. Like it would have been something that someone told her to say that she said to try to get off the hook or something. Oh, you think so? I mean, because this this took place in, what, the 1800s, right? It did, yes, uh, uh, late 1800s. So how do you think that um, a woman lived in the 1800s, late 1800s? How do you think, like, did you kind of go through that of, of what her life would have been like as a female compared to now? Like, you know, over 100 years later, you know, you, you can do so much more. You've got so much freedom right. today that I'm sure in the 1800s she didn't... I mean, uh, women weren't voting then either, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder how how that would have been um, addressed to her. Maybe she would have been told and she would have listened. I mean, I just... Uh, that, see, things like that are cu I'm very curious about. So was I, especially because we, we know some of the Gilded era and Victorian era and the ladies of that time but not a whole lot from the perspective of her class, which would have been working class. And uh, we, know, we know like a lot about the wealthy class of that era, but not a ton about the working class, um, especially the indentured servants of that time, especially if they were women. And I, I had a really good time going into the wormhole of researching that time from the perspective of a woman, because I mean, like, it's just so trippy to me how in the Victorian time is like where, where we came up with the the words toilet. Like, we, we couldn't say what it actually was. So they made up a euphemism for it. That's why we have table skirts, because the legs of the table were too sexy. Like, that's why we call chicken light and dark meat instead of breast and thigh, because we couldn't say it. Um, and it's just really interesting to me how a culture that is so repressed in, in that level of the class system would have been so different for someone like Jane because she would have been the one, you know, washing everyone's underwear. Like, that would have been her job. That's gross. And there was so much you couldn't talk about then. Like, you couldn't, if you had, a, a pro, like, a feminine problem, you couldn't ask another woman about it. You couldn't ask anyone about it. No one really knew because... Even medical science wasn't that advanced then. Like, they barely knew how to wash their hands. I mean, I know we're going through a thing now where we have to reteach people how to wash their hands, <laughs> but they didn't know that you needed to until very, very shortly before this was happening. So, um, yeah, researching a lot of the history around that, especially uh, women's, I don't want to say like women's issues, I feel like that's a little bit reductive, but like, how did they get dressed in the morning? What time did they get up? What Were they allowed to eat in front of men? Because sometimes no, sometimes yes. Sometimes you would get sick because you had to eat after the people who owned the household. So you just like let it sit on the stove and they didn't know that you would get food poisoning if it just stayed there all day. So um, I, kind of, I think I kind of answered your question about how our research like around her life about what it was like to be alive then. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think that that really rounds off a book because it um, so many people don't know that and they they don't really understand or realize um, 
how different it really was. Oh, it's so, so different. And I, went, I got to go to Boston, too. I, I live in Atlanta, if y'all can't hear from my accent, like, um, <laughs> country. Um, the, but, like, even the architecture was different. Like, the front porches are just, they would have been different in that time period. So I went on a ton of historical tours just because, you know, what's common to me would not have been common in that geography or era. So that right. research was really fun to do. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Um, it should be part of a, a story or a book, I think, because I think it puts you in the in the scene, and then you can start to feel it or understand it better as things happen. But what do I know? Um, so now let's talk about um, the killer, Jane okay. Jane Toppin, I believe yeah. was her name, or they called her what uh, Jolly Jolly um, something, mm -hmm. didn't they? Oh yeah, she had a lot of nicknames. None <laughs> of them were very nice. That's like me. <laughs> um, so the, what was her story? So where did she come from? Was she, uh, how was she, you know, kind of explain her background. Okay, so from what we know, and this is uh, based on very loose historical records of the time, she was born in America to Irish immigrants um, who fled the, uh, the famine of Ireland that lasted so long. Um, and her, and this is what really got my attention when I was listening to the story. Because you know, you listen to murder podcasts and it's like, let me guess, the husband did it. You know, like it's kind of, you fall into those patterns. But, um, so her mother died from tuberculosis when Jane was an infant, um, leaving only her father to provide for either two or four children total. Records are kind of dicey on that. Um, and then her father who was a tailor, um, so, you know, you think, I would think like Taylor better than, you know, manual hard labor at the time. I would think like better situation, but apparently, um, and this again from loose historical records is, uh, the, the fact that he suffered from alcoholism. I can only imagine some severe stress from having to support four children and a dying wife and, and alcoholism as well. I couldn't remember if I said that part out loud. I was organizing things in my brain. Sometimes it doesn't make it all the way out. <laughs> and he, and this is a quote from some records at the time, uh, lost his mind and tried to sew his eyelids shut. And that's the point that, I, like I said, got my attention where I was like, and I have such a macabre reaction to everything that I was like, well, he definitely did not do that because how could you see to sew the second one shut? Like you couldn't do both. And I was like, oh, I'm a terrible person. Okay. I need to write that down because I feel like that's how we deal with things that are uncomfortable is we, you know, make a joke out of it just oh, so yeah. it kind yeah. of makes it more, um, tenable. So, so that uh, is the, is the, her parentage kind of, but, but did he, uh, she, did he really do that? Did he really sew his eye shuts? That's what they say. So it's written down, but it's written down as a sort of oral history of like that. That was like the rumor that circulated through the staff at her um, orphanage, which they at the time called a female asylum, uh, which doesn't sound like what it is to us now, but is actually like a little bit more accurate for what the, ter the term tech, like, connotatively means. Anyway, yeah, so we don't know if he did that. Um, my guess is it would be really hard to do even for a talented uh, tailor. <laughs> um, so, but he, anyway, kind of came to some realization and surrendered both Jane and her elder sister, who was elder by only a few years, to um, the Boston Female Asylum, where they were supposed to be indentured out, I believe, at the age of 10 or 12 was 12 was ideal. 10 was like, if someone will take you, we would we'll make that happen because they only learned skills that were necessary for their class. And that's just not just me like being a bad human, but that's like, that's what the, the, I want to say bylaws, but like the rules or the founding documents of that institution said is that we want to teach them things they can use on a regular basis so that when they are indentured out as servants, they'll know how to do it. Like laundry, uh, mending things, cooking, how to, how to clean a fireplace, that kind of stuff. Um, and Jane, because she was super precocious and really smart and fun to be around and she had a great sense of humor and 
told great stories, like all the kids were obsessed with her. And she was indentured out when she was eight, which is four years longer of indenture, of in, yeah, indenture uh, than you know you than you bargained for. So Auntie Top then got a really good deal from Jane. Um, yeah, I can't remember where what qu question started this, but that's kind of what her beginnings were. Is like she went into the um, the top end household and was kind of a foster sister to Elizabeth, who was much older than she was, but acted a similar age, which I found disturbing in the research because the way that they interacted was like as peers, and it turns out she's like a full generation older. Um, Why do you think that was? I, I think it had to do with class, and this is me just guessing really, but um, it seems to me like Jane had to grow up really fast. Um, she was kind of on her own at the age of eight. Like she was fostered, but never adopted. Like she was definitely treated like a servant and not like a child from all of the research that I found. And Elizabeth, her foster sister, was just kind of, you know, a, a silver spoon baby. Like, uh, you know, ladies weren't supposed to do work or anything really um, I don't want to say like anything useful, but they were supposed to be pretty and dainty and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it was really just a different ideal because of their class. Mm. So, so it made for a clash. <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, she probably uh, had to learn the hard way, as you know, coming from a poor background and 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 the one that had the money, Elizabeth. Um, things were kind of done for her, right? So mm -hmm. that would be a total different skill level for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so where did, where does she go from the family, and how did she get into uh, what we call into all this serial killing? So um, that's a great question. Uh, we know from the crimin her criminal records that it was definitely escalating behavior. I think – and. The, the thing about, like, writing about things that happen in real life, as I'm sure that y'all know, is it, we don't always have, or we almost never have, like, a straight narrative of this caused this caused this, and that is, that is how it happened. Um, so many things, I think, can be true from the fact that we see a lot of sociopathic criminals who are very intelligent, but taught to hate themselves because that doesn't fit who they're supposed to be. Um, so I think that that is probably the root of this. She was born Honora Kelly, which is the most Irish name. Like, my name's Mary Kay McBrayer. Like, that's pretty Irish Catholic, but Honora Kelly is, like, very Irish, I think. Um, like, you could tell on paper what who, where she was from before you saw her. Um, and they made her change her name when she was eight, like that, because it, because it was too her name was too Irish. Like that's wild to me that you can, you, like you you made her change her name. Like she didn't even get to pick her name, her new name, and it's it's just a kind of bland. It's a fine name, Jane is, but you know you associate it with like a Jane Doe usually or plain Jane. So it's not it doesn't really imitate her personality. Um, I think that was part of it. I think also she was probably um, favored by her peers more than Elizabeth was. And I know they weren't really peers, but uh, Jane would have been a lot better suited to entertain than Elizabeth would have because she was so smart and and uh, conversational. And so I don't know that, like I said before, one thing caused the next, but I can imagine just like me, a naturally defiant little bit kind of person um, coming into a household where someone else was favored and it wasn't because of their merit, that would make me mad. And I don't know, I don't think that I would kill anyone because of it, but I would definitely do something about it vindictively. If there was nothing I could do straightforwardly. So I think, I think just a lifetime of that. And then when, when her, um, and this is a little bit of a spoiler. So uh, listeners, if you haven't read it and you don't want it to be spoiled, I mean, it did happen 120 years ago, so the cat's out of the bag, but um, if you don't want to know before you read it, um, she 
when Auntie dies, she leaves Jane nothing in her will, which is a big slap in the face. Uh, it, even after, even though she stayed on after her indenture was finished. And um, I think that would make someone very resentful. Um, so at that point, she kind of, you know, gathered up all of her will and saved up and then went to nursing school where she had a lot of power and not a lot of supervision. And it escalated, right? So like at first, she was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, help this person out or um, and this is from Harold Schechter's book, which was the part that made me like lean in so my nose was so close to the page I could barely see. Uh, but she would dose her patients, like her favorite patients, she didn't want them to leave. So she'd give them something to make them have symptoms of sickness so they'd stay around. And then well, sometimes she would go like too far. And then she would give them, administer the antidote and bring them back. And I think um, from what I understand, that's one of the, escalating behaviors where she would try to like, get people almost dead and then bring them back because it was a real power rush. Um, so that's one of the ways that those behaviors escalated. And then, of course, like sometimes she got a little sloppy because she did it too much and those people died. But then again, because she was in a hospital and, you know, medical science was not that far advanced, a lot of people died <laughs> in the hospital and for, for reasons they couldn't tell. So I think that's how she got away with it and then how those behaviors kind of culminated. Uh, was she ever a, you know, what they call those type of nurses, uh, angel of, angels of death? I mean, did, was she ever an angel of mercy at all and then transitioned to the angel of death or was pretty much, you know, a killer from that moment and, and may have been one of the reasons why, you know, she became a nurse? So great question. I... I'm not sure about the mercy killing, if it was actually an assisted suicide type of situation ever, or if that was just something that she would have told herself so that she could kind of get around the morality of it. It's gray. It's a gray area, and it wasn't documented, which I get, because you wouldn't want to make a killer sympathetic, especially at that time, uh, in, the, in the documentation of it, I mean. So that's a good question that I don't have a straight-up answer for, but it's a good question. Well, you know, I, I, I have to think that, um, so she had issues with her uh, adopted family, you would say, and she's now she's nursing. I, I have to wonder why she didn't take it out on her stepsister. Mm. Mm -hmm. Rather than, hmm. let's say, people at a hospital or mm -hmm. like, like, and do you know, uh, did you find out why she wanted to be a nurse? Was there anything about that? So, um, I think I got two questions from you. Um, oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> no, I just want to take them, uh, one at a time. So you asked why, um, she didn't take it out on her sister. Um, so, if you don't want to spoil her, <laughs> skip ahead, um, well, because she does. Earmuffs. <laughs> earmuffs. definitely does. Um, but I, it, it almost seems like a, it started off as a, a more of a power thing, and then it became more vindictive, I think. Um, but I don't know. Like, it definitely seems like I would take it out on someone. I mean, not, I would never do that, of course. But I would definitely sure. try to. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would never, never do. Mm -mm, never, not me. Not, not poison. I don't have access to any of this stuff. Morphine's not over the counter anymore. It was, though. Can you believe that? Morphine and strychnine both over the counter as medicine. So what's wrong with that? I mean, it it, it will be your last headache. <laughs> um so, wait, where is that? I lost my train of thought. Uh, did you know why she became a nurse? Yes. Okay. Why she became a nurse. Um, it was one of the very few um, positions that women could have and be financially independent, I think. Uh, it also was a lot of grunt work. Like, from what I... I mean, nurses have it hard now. Like, that is a hard job. And, it, I mean... There's no other way to say it really, except for it requires you to be really smart on several different levels and very patient and very low anxiety. Um, so 
it, it's a hard job. And then it was also, it was all of those things plus a lot of custodial work, which she would have been doing her whole life. So it would be like not a big change, you know, like from, I mean, just more people and more sick people. And um, she didn't actually, and this is fascinating to me too, she didn't start nursing school until, until she was 28, which um, now is kind of later than most nurses get in the game, I think. But then that would have been like, well, you you either got four kids or one foot in the dirt. Like that's at 28. That's, and that's an old mate, you know? So I think it was that she was a little bit disillusioned when her foster mother died and she was like, uh, well, now what I'm supposed to do, I'm, I mean, I was kind of part of the family or I thought, and I'm not. So I have to kind of, she had to go make her own way. And I think nursing was the easiest transition. Plus she could use a lot of her intelligence that she probably hadn't been able to before. Um, mm. I just have to wonder also why. Okay, so she becomes a nurse. Generally, people, don't they become a nurse? I, I mean, I say that because I've never never wanted to be a nurse. Uh, but I would, I would imagine you generally want to help people. You gen generally want to um, be someone that um, helps people get better. And, and you must, you must I, you know, I would think uh, in general, and maybe she did because she wanted money and it would give her independence and, and some freedom um, for the time, especially. Um, but I just wonder how that, in her mind, developed into wanting to to actually kill people. I think that's a great question, too. Um, I, I also, when I think of a nurse, typically think of a very nurturing personality, someone who wants to help you get better. Um, and. But then I also think about how, and this is just like, you know, this is not researched or anything like that from, from my perspective, but um, in order to really take care of someone, like you think about surgeries that people have to do where they cut your body open while you're awake and you have to be able to dissociate from, you know, the idea that that's a person in front of you, like, um which I don't think makes you a good or bad person. I think she was a bad person, but I don't. Uh, it's kind of using that ability to help people or just having that ability and telling yourself you're going to do it to, to help people. So hmm. it's I a wonder, great question. Do you think, I would just wonder, I wonder if she had it in her mind to do, the, do all of this when she was be going to become a nurse. I wonder if it was planned in her mind somewhere how this this was something she was going to do. Yeah. I mean, it, probably not. You see, because I always wonder, because when we hear about these serial killers, and, and I've written about some myself, and I see I that, <laughs> well, and I see that, um, you know, some of them have really, really bad young lives, but so do a lot of people. Right. And And why do some turn it into this behavior of, torturing right. or killing and, and hurting people, and others don't. Some people turn out being really successful and mm -hmm. leading pretty good lives. So I wonder what the key is, what that one thing, or if there's more than one thing, what makes a person go off in that direction? Nature know? versus nurture, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that is the question. I mean, truly, that if we had the answer to that, we would be able to make our world so much better, I think. Um, but yeah. I mean, you're right though. I mean, like we know that hurt people hurt people as what? cliche as it sounds, but not all people, not all hurt people hurt people. Right. So, so where do you weigh in on that then? Do you think it's more nature, more nurture? What are your well, thoughts there? It, I mean, it seems like they don't necessarily, it's not one or the other because you have people who had perfectly fine childhoods and end up being monsters. And then you have people who have terrible childhoods and be and end up being monsters, and then vice versa as well. Or, um, you know, you have kids with terrible home lives and they end up being fine. Uh, so I I think it's it has to be somewhat has to be both. I think um, it's like a 
I don't know, because I, I mean, we, we hear the, like, or maybe not uh, super research, but I've seen newspaper articles where it's like, so most CEOs and surgeons are sociopaths, but they use that skill for good. And, or, or and I don't know if that makes sense. I might have really overgeneralized, but... No, I, know. I, I, I read the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They have okay. similar personalities to, to sociopaths. Um, you know, they have similar traits. Whether how they use them is is obviously the big difference. <laughs> yeah. So I think maybe for people who have that natural inclination to dissociate from others, um, it's it, it maybe they have to work a little bit harder to to have that empathy. But I don't. I mean, I'm not sure that there are just bad kids born. You know, like I don't. I don't want to believe that, at least. Yeah, I'm sort of, I, if they are born with something, it, it, it's definitely um, physical. It's not like, like there's a deformity in the brain somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't believe you're born as, let's say, Satan or evil, or there's a evil spirit that, uh, you know, came into you <laughs> at, yeah. at birth and then it developed. I, I think there's something more going on here, but, um, you know. Like I said, now do you think that now she admitted to killing thirty-one, I believe, right? Um, so if she wouldn't have been caught, do you think she would have kept on killing until? Oh yeah, she was getting real sloppy there right before she got caught. She killed a whole family, like all in, within like the same season. It's like from all different reasons, like that their deaths were all different reasons. Like I think. She was just getting, like, it had escalated to being very reckless and pointless. Like, she, those were her friends. Like, she was really just seeing how far she could get up, she could go. Um, wow. So I wonder if she just got better at killing, and as she got away with it, she just wanted to do more? I wonder if she got addicted to the feeling. I think so. I think it was that rush of power, um... It, I guess we could call it adrenaline. I'm not really sure if it is, but when you help someone suddenly, you know, you feel that kind of, it's almost ec ecstatic. Like you, you know, yell at a pet before it gets hit by a car, you know, like something like that, where it's like, oh man, I f you know, you kind of get a little bit of a buzz from doing something like that. And I think that's kind of where, like she kept pushing it, as far as she could go, because that's the way that addictions work, is like you have to get the next bigger thing. And like you can't just do the same thing again. It's not going to feel the same because you already did it. Get mm. up it a little bit. Well, did, her, did her killings kind of uh, go that way? Was it something, did she get more aggressive and more violent with her killings, or did they progress in some sort of way? So, um, yes. And she got sloppier with it. Um, so it, they kind of snowballed into each other after Elizabeth, I believe, because she got away with that one. And that was the person who was pretty much closest to her. She killed several of her friends to get things they had um, and went into people that she knew. It was her patients or the elderly because... And this is her, these are her words, not mine. Um, what's the point of keeping them alive? Like, what kind of quality of life is that? Um, again, not what I think or believe at all, but that was one of the things that she was overheard saying while she was in nursing school that she got reported for and dismissed for. Um, so I think that what she could cover um, the killings of of a, I don't um, maybe not able-bodied, but like, well, they were well, they weren't sick. Um, w when she got away with those, I think it was kind of like, well, what else can I get away with? Um, sometimes it was a matter of convenience, but I definitely think when it came to the Davis family, it was escalating really quickly, and she set a number of fires at that time. It, it was, it, it just got very out of hand. <laughs> um yeah, it sounds like she almost kind of led to her downfall. You know, she kept getting away with it, more power, then kept getting sloppier. Uh, and that, pro you know, she probably kind of led to her own downfall without mm -hmm. wanting to, to cover it up. I mean, it's really difficult to ki track a serial killer, excuse me, serial killer now, let alone 120, 140 years ago. Um, right. so Especially it sounds like she, she didn't have a profile. Like, it was just anyone, kind of. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, she was openly, she openly admitted to, to killing these people. She even said she was not insane at all mm-hmm. um, when she committed these murders. Uh, yet she was convicted of insanity um, for the murders. So I'm just trying to understand the reasoning behind the verdict. It goes yeah. against what she even said. So why, why would she be given a guilty with insanity? even though she openly admitted she was completely logical and and, and insane when she committed these murders? Um, Great questions. I love those questions. Those were some that I tried to explore when I was writing it without ever, like, settling on one one answer, because I don't know that there is one answer. I know that um, the judicial system then worked um, differently than it it does now. Um, This is around the same time as Lizzie Borden, which she did it, we know she did it. Like, there's no one else who could have did it. It was Lizzie. But she got off because she was a woman and a lady, and it was just, like, not, uh, mm-mm, that could, couldn't be her. So I think the time period had a lot to do with that. I think it was also that while she was in prison, she got so many letters of support from her former patients and friends just saying, we know you didn't do this, like, we're with you. Um, Her childhood friend represented her um, free of charge in in her trial. Um, She didn't look evil. She was, like, kind of (laughs) hot, especially by Victorian standards. Um, So people were like, that doesn't fit the idea of a maniac in my mind, so that can't be right. And so saying that she was guilty but insane um, was, kind of, was kind of a pass almost to say, well, yes, she did do it, but she, she was crazy when she did it. So that's the only reason that she did it. They needed um, to justify it in their own head so they can keep going on with their lives. Otherwise, thinking that a normal person can just do that at any time probably would drive yeah. you pretty crazy at that time. I, I think so. Like, how do, how do you fit that into the world you live in? I don't think that you can. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's a really different era. Now Now we, we know. We I mean, we live with serial killers all the time. In fact, it's our entertainment back then. <laughs> although, you know, violence and all that stuff was still like that, not to the level it was now and not to the publicity. Yeah, I mean, they... Uh, you're exactly right. I, they, especially in the Victorian time, they were fascinated with killers and stuff. Like they would, when someone was killed, they, the people would show up and just take mm-hmm. all of the stuff from their houses. Mm-hmm. And they would have scrapbooks of newspaper clippings about people who were you know, executed or murdered or, you know, some kind of, they just had scrapbooks of it because it was like, we don't have a TV, so let's read over these old cases. <laughs> uh, but not to the degree that we do now, especially, um, the level of detail that we can get. Uh, I mean, I could just turn on my TV right now and, you know, find anything I wanted pretty much. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that that was a large part of it. And, and because um, well, she was a nurse. Like, that is disturbing mm. to think that someone who's supposed to save you from these things is actually inflicting them upon you because they're bored. Like, for no other motive, really, except for just to see if she could. Well, That's makes me want to go to the hospital. <laughs> right. Well, now you know why people hate going to the hospital. She, yeah, probably, she probably started that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And speaking of, like, stuff that I researched to get a handle on the time period, just if you weren't sick when you went to the hospital, you would be by the time you left. Like, mm. it was so yuck. So yucky. Hospitalism was a thing. What is that? Like, what? <laughs> it's so gross. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, so what do you what do you think? Um, I don't know. What, what what do you hope people get out of your book when they read it? Um. So I say a little bit. I, I kind of address that a little in the author's note of the book. Uh, what I hope that people will take away is just that a lot of things can be simultaneously true, even though we we want to be able to say, oh, that person was just evil. That's it. That's all there is to it. Um, because it absolves us of any responsibility. I don't 
think that is the way that our society wants to continue because I don't think that in in this case I, I don't think that she had like that was not her fate it, it wasn't like predestined that she was going to be a monster I think that things happened at her and brought that out of her hmm. and I think that that still happens a lot and it still has a lot to do with class and gender and the early intervention that could have happened for her is we see it so often in the stories about the famous male serial killers, right? Like where um, Charles Manson was bullied as a child. He had a really terrible upbringing. He was in the judicial system when he was like five. Like if any one person had been like, that's wrong. Take him out of there. Like he doesn't need that. I mean, that could have been the early intervention that saved a ton of lives. Hmm. Um, and I, I think that that just, I mean, I tried to do it myself. I said that in the um, author's note. I, like I, I tried to, serve, to, you know, provide that kind of care. And it just, it takes a really special person to be able to go into those types of situations and compartmentalize um the things that they can help and the things they can't. And it was not me. Like I couldn't do it. I was not like, I wasn't emotionally strong enough to deal with it. But I, I hope that, I mean, my, the ultimate purpose behind writing it is that someone would read that, see the gray area and be like, okay, I'm going to do something about it or tell, or, you know, at some point someone will be able to pinpoint that sort of uh, crux that you were asking about. I think uh, Brian and Alan, I think both of y'all are saying like, so where does the, the nurture take over from the nature? And I'm hoping that someone will read this book and be like, I think that I can add to that conversation. Really, I think that's the main takeaway. Plus, I just feel like she deserved to be, I mean, I don't want to lionize her because she was in fact a monster, just like all serial killers are. But I think there's just more to her story. And I think I mean, we pay so much attention to the male ones that it just seems like this one should be considered as well. Hmm. That's pretty. Uh, so now, do you have a, a website or a place that you prefer people to come find you at? Sure. Um, I have my author site is just my name, Mary Kay McBrayer. Dot com. I'm also on Twitter at uh, MK McBrayer and Instagram at Mary Kay McBrayer. It's really just my name all the way down. Like if you type it into anything, there I will be. Um, so anywhere is good, and I and I love to hear from people who have read the book or and liked it or didn't or just you know have questions about it. That's you know, writing is so much in a vacuum. So much of the time that when someone else is in there with you, it's it's it feels good. Well, that's great. We'll have that on our website as well, so people listening can find you real easy. Well, so has COVID been okay for you during the writing and process? Uh, has it altered your performance any? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. I, yeah, it's just, I mean, I think it is, it tries people in different ways, you know. Um, I was in the process of researching another book and I wanted to go to the place where it was happening and it, you know, I can't do that yet. Mm -hmm. So a lot of sitting at home and hurry up and waiting and just <laughs> getting things together. And then I think also, and I haven't, I mean, this is just kind of a realization that I had like today, but so much art in the form of entertainment, like TV and movies, the releases have been delayed. And I think that, you know, life imitates art. And so it's like, there's, it's, uh, it's unstimulating right now, but, and, and, you know, in some ways it makes all of us because of that pay attention to important civil rights things that are happening, important political things that are happening. So it's been okay. It's definitely been different. I'm looking forward to getting back to, you know, sort of normal. You gonna, are you going to continue writing true crime then for a while? I think so. I think that probably the next thing I write will be a little less heavy because this, this one was a real bummer. Um, <laughs> it, as fun as Jane was as a character, because I think that, I don't know, she just, she feels to me like she could really work her room. You know, like if, she, if she's blown, she's in there. You know, if she's there, she's in there. Um, but I think it would be, 
you know, nice to, I said this to someone who was asking me, like, I, I was back when we could hang out with people outside of our homes. Um, they were like, what's wrong? And I was like, you know, I just, you know, killed four people on the page today. <laughs> it's like real happy. Like, you got to get in there with the characters. And it's, uh, I, I'm looking forward to something a little bit, I mean, still heavy and still important, but a little bit maybe less murdery. Specifically, yeah, well, <laughs> just a little murder next time. Huh? 31. Oh, that's, that's okay, too. <laughs> well, again, you know, thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, and uh, we'll see where you go from here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was a delight. I love y'all's questions, and I hope that we stay in touch and that I can return that favor someday. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.